Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the Marketplace Discussions podcast. My name is Mahmoud Resmi, and today's guest is Hassan Osman. Hassan is a creator on the side who managed to build a portfolio of side hustles in addition to his full-time job. He is Senior Vice President at NWN Carousel, where he leads the organization's uh, professional services team. And his portfolio includes books, online courses, and a podcast. He is author of several Amazon bestsellers, including Influencing Virtual Teams, Don't Reply All, and most recently, ChatGPT for Nonfiction Authors. His podcast, Writer on the Side, helps full-time employees write and publish their nonfiction books. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. If you have any questions or any comments, please feel free to leave them in the comments section below if you're on YouTube, or you can reach out to me at DecafQuest uh, on Twitter. Thank you very much uh, for joining me today and for accepting the invitation to join the Marketplace Discussions podcast. I'm really super excited about this one uh, and I'll start or I'll jump right into it with just uh, tell us about yourself a little bit. Yeah. So um, where do I start? Tell me about myself. So I have a full day job or full time job. Uh, right now, I am a senior vice president uh, of professional services at a company called NWN Carousel, uh, which focuses on hybrid work for for companies. And I always have to say this, whether I, um, you know, I'm employed or not, is that views are my own, <laughs> not the, those of my employer. Uh, and I recently started this job, so it's just it's just been a couple of weeks here. But um, in my free time, whether it's uh, weeknights or weekends, my uh, to do or or a thing that I enjoy doing is uh, writing books and publishing courses on the side. And I've been doing this for quite a while. I uh, started out with my first job. Uh, I was in consulting at EY. Back then it was Ernst & Young. And then for 12 years at Cisco Systems, I uh, kept sort of doing, uh, writing books and publishing courses uh, while running uh, a full-time demanding job and having a family. So I'm married, I've got two little girls. Uh, as well, so that's sort of it in a in a nutshell. Uh, yeah, and this is so. So uh, there are so many reasons why I reached out, uh, and I'll I'll let you talk about the story as well because uh, you you might want to mention it. But then, uh, and also congratulations on your new job. Uh, thank you. And this is why thank you very much for agreeing to do this, because I understand things might be uh, hectic, perhaps a uh, new job, uh, new role, etc. So, yeah, thank you yeah. again for for agreeing to do this. But yeah, we uh, our point of connection. And let's start with this one is uh, Daniel Vassalo. Because uh, how how did we come to know each other? <laughs> Well, I think I found out about you through him. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of his and I follow him uh, closely. And I think this was... Since when have you been following him, by the way? just uh... Since early 2020, actually. Okay. Maybe a little bit before that. But the way I... The reason why I bring this up is because in early 2020, this was before COVID, like literally the first couple of months, he had published his book and it, it was doing crazy numbers. So... I called, uh, reached out to him, and I said, "Would you like to be on my podcast?" And and in February, he was, he 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 kindly agreed to be on my podcast, and and we ended up talking. But um, but Daniel basically tweeted that he was gonna join one of your cohort based courses about philosophy. It was specifically, I think, it was called the philosophy of money. I think that's how it was called, right? And first of all, I found the topic fascinating. Second of all, I clicked through and I read about you and your background. And I think we shared a little bit of that sort of Lebanese uh, heritage background there. So I was like, I'm in, you know, you got the endorsement of Daniel and uh, and he was going to be in that course, that cohort based course. I ended up watching it, which and, and I'm, I shared this with you, but it was amazing. It was really eye opening for me. Learned a lot. I'm not that into philosophy, but I'm very curious by nature and um even though I knew going into that course, we're not going to get any answers, but it's just that sort of gray matter stimulation through thinking was uh, was great. So that's how we met. And since then, I think we've been following each other on Twitter and 
uh, some overlap there with the small bets community of Daniel, which is amazing. Uh, yeah, indeed. And uh, yeah, thank you uh, for also signing up for the course. Uh, it was particularly a a difficult one uh, for many reasons. But yeah, it's the kind of stuff that I do is maybe I'm I'm going to be asking you about this later yeah. uh, during our conversation. But then you're not that much into philosophy. I will also ask you about this. <laughs> uh, but uh, in any case, yeah, so we we haven't uh, ever uh, met, but then it's because of that you you even saw that I taught at AUB or like, yeah, that's it, AUB and yeah. three books for all your students. <laughs> and uh, so you were willing to, to help. Thank you very much. Uh, again, this was this was nice. And particularly... Uh, I would like to know a little bit more about your background. Uh, I know you grew up in the UAE. You came to, or you went to Lebanon for your undergrad. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your yeah. experience. Yeah, sure. So my parents are Lebanese, uh, both of them. And I was born in, in Beirut, in sort of the middle of the civil war back then. And um, my my parents, specifically my father, uh, just fleeing the country because of what... Uh, what was going on he went to the uae specifically abu dhabi and um he started his own business he was an architect you know the country back then was like a, a desert literally and uh, started just getting projects and and we fled the the civil war so i grew up there i grew up in the uae most people know dubai not a lot of people know that abu dhabi is the capital uh so uh dubai is one of the biggest cities obviously in in the uae so Grew up there, and then a year before graduating high school, we moved to Lebanon. Uh, I went to international college. Uh, it's not a college; it's actually a, a high school, but uh, it's it's sort of uh, a misnomer there with the name. Uh, I did a last year of uh, high school there, graduated, and then I entered AUB as a as a freshman. Um, spent yeah. a year doing that, and. Yeah, and then going into engineering, I did civil engineer. Well, I started out in architecture, then shifted into civil engineering, and then came to the U.S. after graduation. You you went back to Lebanon. Do you remember the year? So that would be if we're. Uh, I remember exactly. Late... Yeah, ninety five. Ninety ninety five. Yep. So I went. I we we uh, moved to Lebanon in ninety five. Did a year there of high school. I entered AUB in nineteen ninety six. How how was the experience? Uh, it was a culture shock, like some sort of culture shock. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From from going so Lebanon, as you probably know, is one of the more liberal countries in that region, right? In terms of you know the Gulf and 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 all of that. Um, and I remember it was definitely a little bit of a culture shock coming in from a conservative country and then moving into a country which was very open in terms of ideas, in terms of diversity too. So the school I went to, International College or IC, uh, for sure, it was also uh, an international American school or it was sort of an American system. So you have a lot of expats too. Uh, so you're not only getting the culture shock of Lebanon and Beirut in particular, but you're also getting the imported cultural uh, uh, sort of shock from others that have moved to the country. Um, and that experience moved with me into freshman. So when I went into AUB, the American University of Beirut, AUB, as you know, is is, is one of the great, better schools in the region, not just in Lebanon. And so you also get this magnet of of um, of thoughts and and diversity and uh, different ways of thinking from the countries around it. I mean, I I even had a couple of American friends in the American University of Beirut when I was starting out. Um, so, um, so yeah, it was it was a little bit of a shock. It was a little bit of an eye opener for sure. Uh, yeah, and uh, for those wondering why I'm asking about this, well, because I I taught at at AUB for uh, five uh, or six years, and I would usually get Lebanese students uh, who grew up in the UAE and other uh, Gulf countries, and they they would experience this culture shock. So when I taught freshmen, uh, they would. It would be one like they it 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 showed 
on their faces that they were they were kind of disoriented like where <laughs> where so add add all these experiences together i i usually understood the the students and i and we we would spend uh, as i told you before like the, an entire session just discussing these differences the culture shocks but not only in terms of culture and meeting uh people from all over uh the world from different backgrounds etc because maybe abu dhabi in the uh 80s was a bit different uh but like now students 2000 then 2007 they they use they they were already exposed to different cultures but coming to beirut it was a whole new experience to oh, them. of course of course yeah. i mean one thing to add keep in mind back then internet was almost n- not existing oh, exactly right? I mean, yeah so so i mean even today even if you live in a particular country and you don't travel at all just the exposure you get through your smartphone is gonna mitigate that cultural shock uh by oh believe that. me despite that i think it's because it, it can give you a distorted image perhaps because True. they they come to beirut maybe they they have one particular idea in mind and then they live and it's it's a completely different experience not a bad one it's just a yeah uh different. different ways of doing things right and add to it in my case it's a philosophy course so <laughs> they're like what the hell are we doing here why many many of them i have nowadays it depends also on on the country but many of them uh hadn't even uh uh learned philosophy before or taken any courses have you taken any i i assume liberal arts you had to take a few cultural I studies did. I did in in freshman. So uh, you know the program usually you've got a few electives, and I did select uh, one philosophy course. Actually, it wasn't a general philosophy course; it was a logic course. So that's the pragmatic side of philosophy. Um, I wish I did end up taking. I mean, there was even a course which was quite controversial about the existence of God. I remember that was given at AUB and this was, you know, talking about culture shock, right? Like religion is something you don't talk about a lot, or at at least you don't challenge a lot in in some countries, but with Lebanon, everything's on the table. Yeah, Yeah, you can talk about it. So, and it was from the perspective of different religions. It wasn't like focusing on uh, Christianity or Islam or, or Druze or, I mean, it was just everything, just the idea of does God exist or not. I didn't I didn't take that course, but I, I had friends who did. And it was just very interesting discussions we'd have uh, on on the West Hole side and, and the Green God. Oval. Typical, <laughs> typical AU bite. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, as an engineering student. Yeah, but we, we'll get into, into more. Yeah, the inner uh aub jokes but uh any any <laughs> other any other cultural uh, studies courses where you uh required to take any any of them not necessarily philosophy but you know cvsp one two three cultural studies yes cultural we history. did take culture cs i think it was called cs 101 culture studies 101 uh and then there was one about the um i think it was like the history of art and then there was one about um Stephen Hawking's like the black hole. Yeah. I mean, there, there was a, so yeah, you, that was you, like you a did classic. take the, the, the series, yeah, a yeah. couple of them, a couple of anything them, yeah. stuck with you. Um, I'm, I'm getting somewhere eventually with this, but yeah. <laughs> uh, honestly I, speaking as an engineering student, you were just uh, in it for the grade because you had to, or what was your experience? Yeah. Your um, perspective. Look, I, Maybe the best way to help explain this is to just fast forward a little bit into what happened after, and then I'll go back to this. So after I I graduated my, you know, from freshman in AUB, I applied to uh, the architecture school, uh, which was very, very competitive. And the only reason why I applied to that was because my father's an architect and just the typical Lebanese mentality. (laughs) I'm the eldest son. (laughs) I end up taking over the family business and, and, and all of that, right? Uh, I started architecture. It was horrible. It was I, I got accepted, which was amazing. It made my father happy. It made you know the greater family happy, but I was miserable because architecture, first of all, is super competitive, specifically in in Lebanon. I remember the first day, um, he was a professor from MIT, uh, Lebanese, and he goes, "Look, there's only so much architects in the world. This is a five year program." Nearly 95% of you will have to repeat at least one year out of those five years. It was just like uh, insane, you know, and and 
I, you know, I'll, I'll get to some interesting stories about this some at some later point in time. But I ended up dropping out of architecture and I shifted, shifted to civil engineering because that's the closest thing to architecture with the family business. But I felt more at home because it was more logical. It was more one plus one equals two. I didn't have to be thinking outside the box from an artistic standpoint. I didn't have that creativity. So let's rewind back to your question about did anything stick with me and whether I did those because I had to or whether I did them because I wanted to. And the answer is it's because I had to and not a lot stuck, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, I Something did stick with a philosophy course that focused on the logic components. That to me was extremely helpful because it gave me a tool set that I can use from a pragmatic standpoint. So um you know we talked left brain right brains i'm i'm very very much left brained in the sense that it's uh you know it's i in my mind i have to think in terms of sequential steps i have to i i feel like you're going to challenge me on this and i'm no no not at all for yeah <laughs> cha challenge in the sense that um, for for a left brained person you're quite creative with your side hustles well i appreciate i appreciate that vote of confidence but i i can't be creative in the sense that i don't know if i've got that artistic philosophical think out the outside the box type type personality. You, uh, well i have to disagree with this one i think you <laughs> were thinking outside the box way before uh, any of us was and we'll we'll get uh yeah, into I'm this sure we'll talk about that. uh yeah shortly because yeah don't 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 try to convince me otherwise i think what's <laughs> going on here is this is the romantic idea of where we're creative and i understand an architect you know you need to have to, to have a feeling for design and and stuff like that and in, in that case, it's not necessarily thinking outside the box. We can give Zaha Hadid as an example, but <laughs> uh, it's it does take a different kind of interest. So yeah. let's say maybe you didn't, you, you were not interested, uh, as simple as that. Yeah, uh, may, maybe that's the case. Yeah, and I know that... Because electrical you know, talk... engineering also is quite, uh, you know, you, uh, logical on the one hand, but then, I mean you you do have to think outside the box as well true true with engineering you absolutely do it was civil not electrical but oh yes. civil civil it's, civil it's all, my bad my bad that's yeah, 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 okay that's okay <laughs> i think even internally everyone got confused about what they were studying especially those who weren't that uh <laughs> interested in it but uh civil, but, but yeah but yeah yeah so yeah, yeah. um so i ended up even third year into engineering i felt like this is not where my passion is and i ended up shifting into uh it mainly like that was i felt like this is what i want to do so immediately after graduation i applied to uh, graduate school here in the u.s and i shifted my focus from engineering into information technology oh so so your uh ey days were after your graduate studies yes it was after oh. i graduated with my with a master's degree oh and the master's degree you got it from Carnegie Mellon University, which is in Pittsburgh, and that was uh, in information security policy and management. And yeah. So the you uh, the the first job you got at EY, where was that? Uh, it was in Detroit. It was oh, in in the U.S. Yeah. yeah. I did not work so in. Uh, you in, did in, okay. Yeah. I thought <laughs> I thought because okay, this is so this is a somewhat of a cognitive dissonance for me, and in, in terms of in my mind. AUB students, EY, uh, so they graduate, they go to Abu Dhabi, Dubai, uh, you ah. know, work in, in consulting, and then afterwards they do their master's, and then afterwards they move abroad or or something. No, so, yeah, no, your story is uh, different. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. yeah, yeah. It was just so the only the undergrad part was in, in Lebanon, but then when I graduated, I moved directly to the U.S., did my master's, and uh, and started work here. Yeah. So the uh, before I, I I ask you about the the work in uh, at EY or Detroit in this case and in IT, which I know absolutely nothing about. <laughs> so you'll 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 tell me. But but also, yeah, this is this is the thing. You have zero creativity. You said or something. You're not that uh, you know good in in that department. But you at least this was on your LinkedIn. I never saw that anywhere. Like I, it's it's this this was there. Uh, Are you sure, the journalism publishing company. Yes. Oh wow, you're 
I, this this uh, podcast interview feels like a little bit of therapy. You're you're <laughs> taking me back a few years uh, <laughs> deep down. Um, yes. So this was actually I'm 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 glad you brought that up because when I was working at EY, I took uh, an unpaid leave of absence actually, uh, and I worked on a magazine. I started it on the side a little bit, and then I wanted to do it like. <laughs> <laughs> for six months uh, without getting getting paid. It was a financial disaster. <laughs> Let's start there. It was uh, it did not do well, but it was uh, a lot of fun. So what I did was, um, it's a photojournalism magazine. For those who don't know, photojournalism, what differentiates it from photography is that photography focuses on the art. Photojournalism focuses on photos with a story. So it's like you're telling a story through pictures, um, and, you know, the best type of stories that you get are like usually like war photography, right? Like what's going on in a, in a particular war zone and you kind of show what's going on there. Or it could be just what's called a photo essay, a series of photos. And some of the biggest uh, magazines at the time, National Geographic, Time Magazine, those big ones, um, I'd, I'd ask a lot of people, like, do you read those? Like whenever you're you're there and they'd be like, We're, we just look at the pictures. We just flip them. You know, you're waiting at the barber shop or whatever, and you enjoy seeing all those pictures that are like the full spread of the magazine with a little bit of text explaining what's going on and like a series of seven or eight photos. So I was like, why not create a magazine that only focuses on that? Like, I don't want the, the you know, 15 pages of articles and analysis. I'll just choose maybe three or four stories and talk about a particular theme, right? Um, and the idea was to have this as a uh, ad supported magazine. So I started out with this idea of, okay, we'll get some sponsors and then we'll publish the magazine, but then we'll give it away for free, at least initially. So the first maybe three or four um, issues were given out away for free in, in Lebanon to kind of help spread the word and word of mouth and all of that. And then we shifted it into, uh, into a paid product. So, uh, so yeah, and it, it did maybe, I think, eight, 10 issues. And then it was like, I can't sustain it. Like, I, I, I went in naively thinking it's going to be able to make some money and sustain the heavy cost of printing. But and you were running it from uh, the US, you took a leave of absence, but uh, you were I moved to Lebanon for like six. Oh, months. you moved? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to try out. So like you an wanted uh, in Lebanon uh, with a uh, what was it uh, called? It was called suwar, which means suwar. photographs or pictures in, in Arabic. Suwar magazine. Okay. Yeah, that's 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 quite interesting indeed. Uh, and yeah, I saw like you printed uh, 10,000 copies. At least this is, yeah. Yeah. How how did you just like briefly, because I'm, 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 this is, if this is not thinking outside the box, even if it was a failure, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. You learned, you learned, you, you learned a few things. Maybe let's start with this. What, what yeah. did you learn from this venture? Yeah, great question. Um, first of all, that you probably should minimize the uh, the the risks that you take with a lot of those things, right? So um, I did not do enough due diligence about the actual market of whether sponsors actually pay for this or they pay the the market rate of an ad, they usually heavily discounted. So that was a little bit off. Second is what I didn't know, uh, and I'm sure you know this, is that in Lebanon, business is not done on merit or ideas. It is done based on relationships. And I had none, <laughs> like naively going up to like some of the big brands saying, hey, I've got this amazing magazine. Would you like to be a sponsor? And it's like, who the heck is this guy? Like, like, are you seriously just walking into the door expecting business? So, so you know, that a, a few things that I miscalculated, I think I was passionate about the project. I still think it's just an amazing thing. You know, just like you've got coffee table books that people sell hundreds of millions of and, and they enjoy flipping through them. So there's a viable customer for that. And we did get a lot of interest. But I think the biggest shock for me, and I lost some money because the, the cost of printing is a lot. And when I'm giving it out for free, it's not you know, it's not negligible. Um, so I learned that I need to think a little bit differently about ROI and investing and, and taking risks. 
uh, going forward. Uh, yeah, and the 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 pictures you were so you were just asking other uh, photographers to bring in their stories, or how was it? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I actually reached out to established photojournalists, okay. is what yeah. they're called, at AFP, Reuters, and a lot of freelancers. Um, one of them was Bill Foley, who got the uh, um, the Pulitzer Award for Sabra and Shatila, uh, th that massacre. And we actually, I, I published his photos in the magazine back then. Um, so some some really amazing photography, uh, like really, really well-known people. And uh, it was hard because I had to convince them to put this in for free because the magazine wasn't making money, right? Um, but it was great marketing for them because they, they're they the owner of the copyright and they get a lot of um, interest in their work and, and followers and so on and so forth. So I had to, you know, play the convincing game of going to sponsors, trying to get funding and then photojournalists to get their photos and then be the middle person on, on all of that. Why? Why did you why did you take that kind of plunge? Because uh, how, how many years after you started your first job was this? Uh two and a half maybe two and a half years so what was yeah. the thought process because this might tie with what we're going to be discussing yeah uh, about yeah. your side hustles um yeah it was a purely entrepreneurial move with a passion for the subject um so it was sort of you know if i want to do it do things on my own how would that look like i wanted to kind of learn about this field and industry and plus i was really enjoying those photo essays like it was you know like a little bit of a passion project so a combination of some of those i knew i was young i didn't have kids i think i was engaged at the time uh but i did not you know i was married actually but so it was easier to take risks before you had you know building a family and that was sort of like a a little bit of a shot uh on that so a little bit of a calculation plus i had the backup of a job like the the job was there um, you know, at the time, I also wanted to see if I can help my family too, going through some some rough times. So it was like a combination of that, starting a business, family oriented, a little bit of that passion uh, project. And I still had a way back into uh, my full time job. So worst case is I lose a bunch of money, but uh, I, I have some stability yeah, back, it wasn't your sports. typical follow your passion. I want to do this, so you quit your <laughs> job, and and this is this is what characterizes you. Like you built a an entire brand, kind of of on the side of on the side guy. Kind of. Right. I, in addition to your full time job, you uh, have so far that I know of uh, written books on the side. Uh, you've done courses on the side. You do a podcast on the side as well. <laughs> and um, am I forgetting anything? No, that's pretty much it. And, and a couple of blogs. So along with the podcast, it's sort of, I sometimes blog on that. And then with um, another blog called The Couch Manager, which is similar to the books and courses that I teach, but it's also a, a blog that I, uh, that I keep up. But yeah, you pretty much summed it up. Uh, so tell us about, about this. First off, the question would be maybe uh, has two sides to it. On the one hand, did did your venture into this photojournalism kind of uh, field uh, get you to rethink about things? Like, okay, I want to do something on the side, but let me explore how, why, and uh, what was it like to start? Like, yeah. for, what even got you to start thinking about I want yeah. to do other stuff like many yeah. people uh, and we we discussed the freelance uh, mindset in in a previous episode so what many people just uh, enjoy their uh, full-time job right they yeah. uh, they enjoy the security everything they're like okay I, I got it sorted out why should I worry about other things so yeah yeah yeah, excellent question. Look, in fact, before the magazine, I wrote my first book in 2006, 2007. So they saw one, that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> the 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 first day of my first uh, job uh, at EY, I remember going into the office in Michigan and finishing up all my orientation. I got my new laptop and all of that. I went back home. And then I open my personal laptop and I start writing the first few words of my first book. 
uh, so literally, this is, I remember it very clearly, like the exact same first day. Um, so what how do I called? answer this? It was called securing your information in an insecure world. Yeah. Uh, so the so my master's degree was in information security, which for those who are listening, it's basically how to protect your information from hackers, right? Like that's that's the degree I did, but it was focused specifically on the management of it, not so much on the technical side. And my job at Ernst and back then it was called Ernst and Young. Now they rebranded to EY. It was a consultant in that space. So it was fairly a hot topic, and I did a master's degree in it. I was part of the first batch of graduating students of that program. So that's how new it was. And then I went into a consulting arm of EY that focused on that. So I was like, I'm getting a lot of questions. People are asking me to explain things in a basic way. So I was like, I have to write something to put that out there because one, I can leverage the credibility that I got from my master's degree. I can leverage the credibility that I have in my full-time job doing this for big companies. And it's just a natural way to progress. Now, you asked me why did I start with that? And I think the answer, I've been trying to write a blog post or a podcast episode or to talk through a podcast episode answering this question, like why do I do things on the side? And I'm still struggling with it to be fully honest with you, but I think it can be boiled down to carrots and sticks. And what I mean by that is, in, in management, carrots are things that motivate you because of some sort of positive reward, right? It's just like a, you know, a bonus or or some sort of reward. And then with a stick, it's a negative consequence. So if you're if you do X Y Z and it's not up to standards, then you're on a performance improvement plan, or you get fired, or you get disciplined in some way, right? So I'm and I'm talking here not from a management standpoint. I'm talking just as an internal struggle. Um, or or motivating factors. And I think there it's a combination of both that kind of dance uh, together fairly uh, gracefully. Um, and what I mean by that is carrots because it's I genuinely enjoy the process of teaching, whether it's through writing or teaching on you know online courses or having conversations. Um, I don't have any tattoos and I don't judge anyone. For not uh, for for having them, but if I were to ever get one, and I always say this, um, it would be the phrase "ancora imparo," and uh, "ancora imparo" is a Latin phrase or an Italian phrase, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, that means "yet I am still learning" or "still I am learning," depending on how you want to translate it. And it's famous because Michelangelo, the uh, uh, the quintessential Renaissance man, said it at the ripe age of eighty-seven. I think with everything he accomplished. You go, you know, ancora imparo, like yet I still learn. And it's like, I think this constant quest for learning of curiosity and, you know, trying out new different things. I think that's a main driver behind behind what I do, right? But, like that's a carrot for me. Now the money is is good. Like that's, it's not, I, I'm not going to dismiss the fact that having another stream of, of uh, another income stream is fantastic, right? Like you can buy things with them. You can you can have that additional security blanket, and it is a driver. Like that's part of the carrot, but the primary one is really this quest for learning. And I think in my own weird mind, I just get very um, very bored uh, very quickly. So like if I'm just doing one thing over and over, and I don't have that switch uh, to do something else that's mentally stimulating, I think I just uh, I just phase out, right? So that's the carrot part. And then the stick part is this fear of losing potentially a job, right? That at any point in time, uh, my job is not guaranteed. There's this famous uh, book called The Startup of You. It's written by Ben Kasnosha and, uh, and Reid Hoffman. Reid Hoffman was the co-founder of LinkedIn. And the premise of the book is that you should treat your brand or your your what you do as a startup. Like, Literally, you are as a startup, not just as an individual. And one statement they they highlight in the book is this billboard that they read on a highway in, in California that said, a million people overseas can do your job. What makes you so special? And that stuck with me. It's like, you know, it's a wake up call that everyone is dispensable, no matter how skilled you are. And so there's the fear factor of, I need to keep my skills sharp. I need to understand how to build a business, 
how to have some sort of um, uh, uh, you know transferable skills that I can use in another business or another venture or something else. So <laughs> I know it's a philosophical answer answer in a way, but but that sort of carrot and stick <laughs> dynamic is still to this day uh, in the back of my mind. This is this is a very interesting answer. And for now, that's mm -hmm. that's all the uh, that's that's the only word I can think of. <laughs> it, it is philosophical indeed, and there's so much to unpack there. Which is so. I can we can take this anywhere you want, right? Because on the one hand, it's it's this as you said, the mentioning the skills is is quite interesting because uh, you got me thinking about myself here. Uh, it's it's quite yeah i i need to to see how to to focus on this in in this case in my case i i never actually got a full time position as a professor i was always on a part time basis uh, so i was the the risk of losing a job or a stream and an income stream was always there right maybe yeah. this is because i come from a philosophy background so you are more of a philosophy guy than myself <laughs> uh definitely because you thought about this you thought this through i never uh not never it's it's maybe it was because i was busy trying to maintain income streams and this is this is why yeah i was not able to, or i never really thought about the fact that i needed to hone my skills or develop new skills yeah yeah understood so this is it's quite interesting because uh for some reason when it comes and we i this i the the freelance mindset again the book is is really good i i keep going back to it uh how important is it to develop skills like what kind of start with a zero like what what kind of skills should we develop to begin with uh, and why is that important for us to kind of keep on going and keep on learning? Yeah, this is um, this is a great question. And I remember same book, Startup of You. They talk about this concept of permanent beta. Um, permanent. So the, the the concept of beta in the software world is that the the software is not ready for release yet. It's not perfect. It still has a lot of bugs in it. And you need to improve upon it before you get to the alpha version of it, right? And the idea is to, to stay in permanent beta. Um, a simple example of this is to some people, 15 years of experience is one year of experience repeated 15 times. Whereas to other people, 15 years of experience is 15 years of experience, right? So so the the, the premise behind why should we keep our skill sets sharp i think at the fundamental level and uh it's interesting. like i'm talking to a phd in philosophy here so uh <laughs> i'm, I'm learning by, from uh... you man <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the um, yeah yeah I, you should have a phd in philosophy i should be just <laughs> out there trying to learn new skills this is the engineer talking this is the engineer talking so i i think fundamentally it is about survival like i think it's as simple as that um so your i think our brains are wired with everything that we do like that fundamental root foundation of everything we do even us talking today you know building a a, a friendship or relationship it's about survival like at the tribal level like right? right like we, we become friends if someone comes over a hill we get to fight them like because they're the enemy right like that's sort of a uh a way to, to that i think about it and so if you ask me what is the drive for a skill set, I I'll go back to the to the stick, which is look, if you're not ready and this blow happens, uh, even though surprisingly, I've never been in a position where I got laid off. I've seen it happen. I've seen it, you know, through you, for example. I've seen it through a few others where it's it's, you know, the risk is there. And maybe that's why I've been a little bit too analytical about this, is that mathematically, I'm just an, a statistic, and at any point in time. I can be dropped. And so that's the fear factor of not being able to survive. And so what skills do I need to be able to build some sort of a viable business or some transferable skills where if I get the call tomorrow that my job is no longer there, 
I am able to survive, forget, you know, becoming a multimillionaire, just be able to survive with a skill set that I have, coupled with the fact that I had a failure with my magazine, because that was like, I poured a lot of money and I didn't see anything back. Now it's like, okay, I can take more calculated risks where the only big investment is my time. And even if it's a little bit of money, but I still have that cash flow coming in. So instead of spending most of the time on Netflix or back then it was Blockbuster uh, uh, or even, you know, family and friend dinners every single day, I'll take a couple of those days and that evening build something that I can rely on if I fall back. Now, again, survival as a driver, but it's not only that. I have to make this so clear to your listeners because it is not just fear driven. I think if it was only fear driven, I wouldn't have survived. The carrot part is so important. Like it was therapeutic for me, like sitting down and and just, you know, typing and writing and, and teaching and getting the feedback, you know, with the blog initially uh, was great. So it is that dual dual pronged, um, th- like that dichotomy is, is I think what, what drove me for yeah. sure. Interesting. It's it's like some sort of self fulfillment. On the one hand, you're you're see this is the thing you're creating, you're building on the side. This is quite artistic, even if it's not <laughs> artistic in the artsy fartsy sense. Yeah, kind I know of, you what know? you mean. Uh, and and you're you're building, and on the other hand, you're you're developing your skills. And again, this I think this is this is what happened in my case. The seven years of experience in in academia was not really just you know uh, the same thing uh, time and again, but uh, it it. I was cocooned somehow within this uh, institution. I learned much more when I left academia because I was fending for myself now, but in a different way. Because I, I always knew, well, I'll I'll get a course here. I'll I'll get a gig here. It's okay. And you yeah. keep talking to yourself or convincing yourself, yeah, why? Or, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's going to be okay. But then when you're out there, yeah, you'll have to really survive and then you it get you you get all the creative juices kind of running and uh things take a different shape so is this why and maybe you can you can walk us through your your books and you can talk about uh anything you want uh with this question but is this why you jumped on the ai trend now uh, because you recently published a book about how to use gpt it was co-authored yeah. uh with chat <laughs> gpt so is is this why uh, you did this as part of, you know, honing your skills and then jumping on a trend or? Yeah, uh, great, great question. Look, so maybe just for context for those who are listening, because I've written 17 books so far. Uh, the first 16, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean My this to be God, boastful. My God, man. <laughs> uh, it's just, and, and by the way, just to clarify, they, they are very short books, right? So v- Extremely, so I, I bought uh, three. I think I, I bought the uh, email one. I bought the AI one and... The mental uh, models. I, I remember you. The mental you, models. Mental, mental models. models. Yes. Right. Thank you. And, and I appreciate uh, your support. And uh, this is, a, yeah, very short. And I I read them all. Thank you. Cover to <laughs> cover. Pre- so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so when I say 17, it sounds like I'm this, you know, insane machine, but it's not, <laughs> it's not as, uh, as, as hard as people think it takes. But, um, so, and I have a certain philosophy about writing. Uh, and maybe we'll get into that before we get into the AI book, because that was an anomaly, just to kind of start with with that, right? So my philosophy about writing books is, like, when I want to choose a topic, I think about three intersecting circles. Think of a Venn diagram, right? Those, uh, those three circles are interest, experience, and market. So meaning something you're interested in, you don't have to be extremely passionate about it, but you're interested in this topic, right? You might be interested in philosophy. That's your thing. Um, experience, so meaning having some sort of experience in that domain because of credibility, because of, you know, you already kind of are in that space. And then the third uh, circle is market, meaning there's an active buy-sell market about this topic. Uh, people underestimate the importance of that, and there are methods to, to, to kind of look at it. But the intersection of those three, something you're interested in, something you have experience in and something that has an active buy sell market is where I usually focus, right? Um, and there are a couple of other other optional circles. One is job related, uh, meaning the topic is kind of related to your job. Uh, if you're a full-time employee or an entrepreneur, um, it could work either way. Uh, and then another is being an evergreen topic, but just because you want the, you know, it might get 
popular in a couple of years and you want to take advantage of the long-term effects as opposed to the short-term ones. So those are usually my criteria, right? Um, this doesn't always happen with me sitting down and writing, oh, it has to be, you know, check the box as a checklist. It kind of happens organically. But when I kind of talk about how to write a book and all of that, I at least try to guide people towards that because if you miss one of them, there's usually repercussions. It's not always the case. There are exceptions, but if you if you if you're writing about something you're not interested in, it's going to show in your writing. For example, if there's no active buy sell market, it's more of a passion project than an actual viable book, right? So there's that. And so my books have been focused on short books for busy managers. So because I've been uh, at Cisco leading and before that consulting with EY, a lot of the books that I've written, like the one you mentioned about emails, how to communicate better through emails. Also about virtual teams. I've been working from home for a while and, and how do you work with people you don't see? How do you manage them? So I wrote a book about that because it was something I was doing organically. So all those books have been focused a little bit on that. Now I did write in different categories and genres, which we'll talk about here in a second. But, um, but that was like my main fundamental book writing uh, category, short books for busy managers. In December of 2022, when I was writing my next book, it was a book about uh, how to present to business executives. So that's a, usually a big issue in corporate America where people walk into an executive, you know, they think they have 30 minutes, they end up having seven and it's like you're all over the place. So what do you focus on? So it was like literally structuring how to present to an executive leader. And ChatGPT came out, the AI large language model. And I was curious so I wanted to learn how to use that and see how I can leverage ChatGPT to help me write the book about presenting to executives. I started using it, Mahmoud, and I felt like I need to stop because this is just insane. And I'm going to pivot to how ChatGPT can help authors write their own books. So, and I said, you know, I'll have ChatGPT help me write it, right? So I paused writing the book about... Uh, presenting to executives and I spent this was during Christmas break so I was I didn't have you know we're off on on vacation and it literally took me just one week end to end to sit down and write the full book about and it's called chat GPT for nonfiction authors um, it did really well it's still a number one bestseller it's selling around 30 to 50 copies a day I did it for charity it's uh, it's you know 99 cents you can go check it out um, you know, all the proceeds go to, to charity because I felt kind of guilty that I had ChatGPT do the work. <laughs> and I was just like the, you know, the, the conductor uh, guiding it. But, um, but so to your question, this would not have passed my checklist of things to do, because to me, this is not an evergreen topic in the sense that I think it's going to be short-lived because technology advances very quickly. So in a few months, we're going to come up with yet another, diff, you know, technology or some version of it where it's going to, you know, cause my that book to be obsolete. So I usually wouldn't, but this was an exception just because it was a hot topic. I have my podcast about writing on the side. I write books anyway, and it didn't take me such a long time to, 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 to publish it. Um, and it was fun. It was fun doing it. Like I wanted to, to to the point about curiosity, right? It was fun doing it. So I wanted to just do it uh, while enjoying my time, and that's how I published it. Uh, it, it it's it it was it was quite interesting because um, while everyone is talking about whether Chat GPT is good or bad, you were there using it, and this is kind of my heuristic. Like those who are who spend their time debating Chat GPT on on Twitter, <laughs> it's like there are those who are talking about it and those who are using it, and it's quite helpful. Like, yeah, I don't understand why people. I understand why the pros and cons and the debates about whether where this is going, etc. But then, if it it can be a helpful tool. It's a tool. I mean, yeah. and, and it's it's quite interesting. But uh, so I must, many, you know, I, yeah. I I must give you credit for one thing. By the way, I took your guest lecture. Speaking of Daniel Vassalo, um, I know you you and I are guest lecturers uh, and as part of his community and. You gave a talk once, which I think you're still giving, right? I believe you're still uh, June. I'm scheduled that. for another one, yeah. In June, okay, wonderful. So it's it was about stoicism, uh, and that was honestly, genuinely one of the best talks that I've attended because it was such a 
wake up call about how to view the world. In a way, I felt like I was a stoic without even that label. You are, yeah. Um, and maybe, you know, through you, I think you were too kind. You mentioned me on that guest class when I joined. And I think that was a wake up call to reinforce my outlook on life in the sense that you 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 gave it a label and this you know any new topic that comes out i approach it with a very neutral lens in the set like i don't overreact like even with nfts or cryptocurrencies it's more of this curiosity just i want to learn a little bit more about what drives people's behavior towards that right and i don't i i can't relate a lot sometimes with the extreme uh, reactions to either I absolutely love this is going to change the world or I'm, it's going to like to me it's I'm super indifferent to that like I'm just taking it as it is and if tomorrow chat like I'm I'm a fan of chat GPT today but if tomorrow you and I have a conversation and we put the business case that it's horrible for society I'd be like yeah I'd buy that it's horrible for society maybe I should like I'm I'm <laughs> yeah. like uh, so so and I think that's a stoic sort of, without even knowing that it's a stoic type of uh, way of looking at at life so um yeah like to me i just jumped on a trend not because of an opportunity it was more of i'm curious i want to learn the best way to 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 learn something is to teach it and i know how to write books and i'm just going to go through it right so uh, and um, yeah this is this is quite interesting because uh part of one one question i had in mind is is this so are do you do you first off did you i think you started writing books before you started doing the courses right because you also have courses Correct. that you okay Correct. and so what's what's the process like uh is it do you do your research and then uh based on your experience you reflect you iterate and then you come up with a book or is it you do some introspection, you look at how you're dealing with a certain problem because you mentioned it was questions people were asking you and you were trying to respond to this uh, kind of problem that uh, that you were experiencing or others. What's what's the process of uh, writing books for you Is in addition to learning through writing yeah. and, and articulating your ideas? I think the main thing that sparks an idea about a book is what's called scratching your own itch like it's a problem that you face and you want to solve it uh and you end up solving it for you and you feel like this might be helpful for other people to know right so one of them was leading virtual teams it was tough you know how, you know people you don't see how do you manage them how do you build a sense of teamwork collaboration and all of that and people start asking you questions and you're like okay organically this makes a lot of sense email one of the biggest, you know, second most time waster at, at work. Um, I used to get 300 emails a day. And it's it, it's not the volume that bothered me. It was the quality that bothered me. So it's like, you know, when you write, like, it's not just it's a, it's too many emails. It's too many bad emails in team communication, right? I'm not talking about uh, email marketing. This is just, you know, when you're sending me an email, Sometimes, not you personally, but like a, a colleague, it's like seven paragraphs long. And then in the fifth paragraph, third sentence, they have a question. And then there's an action item in the eighth paragraph. Like point those out up the up top, right? Like write a couple of bullet points. Here's what you need and then add all the uh, additional information below. So few things like that, that were bothering me personally, that I felt like, okay, if I were to give someone on my team some guidelines, here's a book. And I ended up writing, it's called Don't Reply All because <laughs> that's the pet peeve at organizations where everyone replies all to everything so oh yeah that's how it starts uh which is which is quite uh interesting because the i have two questions here because uh i know we're almost uh on time and i i i want to ask uh these particularly how did you end up uh doing the jumping into udemy uh and and why did you decide to do these courses not not true not why did you decide to choose udemy in particular but yeah. why courses why and courses? asynchronously yeah and uh what kind of tips uh would you have to encourage other people to either write a book or do a course on yeah. the side so to answer the first question about why uh did i shift to courses i learned early on that different people consume information in different ways and 
I'm the perfect case study of that. Like sometimes I like reading, sometimes I like listening to, to audiobooks when I'm like driving or at the gym or whatever. And then sometimes I like to sit down and, you know, if I'm having my ice cream or a cup of coffee, I don't want to read. I just want to consume by watching. So early on, just reading a lot of blogs about marketing and all of that, that uh, you should repurpose your content into different formats uh, to get the advantages of the different channels. Same thing, being driven by curiosity for learning. It's like, how do you create a YouTube video? Or how do you create, uh, how do you use Camtasia Studio to edit videos and all of that? And I was like, you know what? I've got a book that was fairly successful. People were interested about that. Well, I've done the hard work on the research. Why just not repackage that into a course? Um, and that's been my philosophy since then. So every book that I've published, I've turned into a course, literally just sort of sometimes even reading off some slides, uh, bullet points that are from the book. And it's so interesting because sometimes courses do way better than books. Sometimes books do way better than courses. But to me, it's like minimal effort to maximum return because the hardest part is the research and the, and the, and the actual content of it. And I've been lucky because I started out with Udemy early on. Uh, I'm up to like 200 and I think like 90,000 students now uh, on, on Udemy. That's a is, huge number, man. I, I, I still pinch <laughs> More myself More than what a it. professor would teach us in, in 20 lifetimes or even more. Like 500, it is insane. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm very fortunate. Like, I don't know. You know, sometimes it's just a, a factor of timing. Like it was early in the Udemy days where I started publishing those courses on them. So when started... when was the first course that you launched? Uh... End of 2013. 13. So it okay. was. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. And um, success wise, when 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 did you see this shift? Like when did your uh, courses start maybe selling more? The big the tipping point for courses and books was the pandemic. Because my books and courses were about how to communicate and how to lead uh, remotely. And so people were new to this whole field. I mean, not everyone. A lot of people in tech, this was you know, a regular Tuesday for them. But, uh, but for a lot of people who'd never worked on Zoom or on WebEx or Microsoft Teams, this was completely new. And then they wanted to know what are some of the techniques. So in a way, I was kind of you know, ready for that moment. My courses and my books already were fairly highly reviewed on Udemy and Amazon. And so natural uh, organic, like I'll give you numbers, my influencing virtual teams book, one month before the pandemic, I think was making maybe 200 $300 a month. When the pandemic hit, it went up to like $2,000. Um, that, that didn't last for a very long time, but it was like 2000, 1,900, 2,100, like just for, and this was, nearly zero marketing. In, in fact, I was asked to be on a lot of conferences and all of that, and I did all of that for free. So I was really kind of just, you know, trying to help everyone I can, schools, nonprofits, just giving them insights into how to lead remotely. So I think that was a huge tipping point for me uh, overall. And, you know, I've been fortunate that the um, some of those have been cross-marketed just based on the algorithm. This adaptation uh the, like the is is a skill that is quite important as well this developing curiosity adapting because i i remember back in the day like when we first started doing things on webex i think it was uh yeah some professors were like no i'm not gonna do that <laughs> and uh, yeah. yeah the stubbornness yeah uh, anyway so and uh, when when it comes to tips i know mark yes. baker guru anaerobic uh, is going to be <laughs> listening to this one because of uh, well, the that was going to be a question oh. I was going to ask you. <laughs> so yeah, um, I do sorry, have to, Mark, so... you have to wait till I don't know uh, well an hour to the discussion, but yes, uh, uh, he can fast forward I think up until the end and then go back. But, I'll uh... <laughs> I'll mark it for him, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll explain what we're talking about here for those who don't, who probably don't know what we're talking about. But, but in terms of tips, like this might be a little bit self-serving, but I honestly, I think the best thing to do because of the limited time we have here is I published a book out of those 17 called Write Your Book on the Sides. It is a book that explains in very simple step-by-step -step instructions how to go from knowing nothing about writing a book all the way to potentially even launching a bestseller on Amazon. Um, the book has done fairly well. It's there are over 600 reviews on Amazon. And wow. I know this sounds self-serving, 
but it is 100% free. So the book right now is permanently free on Amazon. It is also permanently free on Gumroad. So if you want to go to writerontheside.com, uh, click on that first link you see on the page and download it. It's um, again, it's like a lot of people have read it, came back to me and said, I just got my first book published, which makes me super happy. I, you know, I'm very fortunate. I don't need the the cash from this, but it's honestly written because I got those questions all the time. It was like, you know what? Everyone is asking me, how do you write on the side while having a family, while having a full-time job? And then you keep just pumping those. And that's, it's it's everything. Like everything is in that book. Um, and I've updated it a couple of times. So that would be tip number one, the big one. But then if um, I give you a philosophical answer and then we'll jump into Guru in aerobics uh, question. Um, if you are thinking about writing a book, then don't. And what I mean by that is, um, and I, 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 this isn't my phrase. I stole it, I think, from Tim Ferriss said it at one point. And, and what I mean by that, he, he meant by that, is that if you were really passionate about writing a book, you would have already started. So if you've been thinking about it for three years or four years, then just don't do it. Like, and, and, and honestly, that's just going to be liberating for some people because you don't want it looming over your head. Uh, now, if the question is, how do I get started or self-publishing versus traditional publishing? Those are valid questions. and Every, nearly every single answer is that is in that book. And, and my top tip would be just start. Like, don't, don't overthink it. Just get a Microsoft Word or Google Doc and just start writing. Just literally sit down and start writing 30 minutes a day, five days a week, and you'll eventually get it done. Um, now, yeah. so that's that. Uh, now I want to pivot a uh, question I should ask you, because on Twitter, before we jumped on this call here, I did say I'm jumping on a call with... Uh, with Mahmoud, and are there any questions you'd like me to ask him? And uh, Guru and Aerobic, Mark, actually asked if uh, if I could ask you, uh, how does it feel, or what does it feel like living under a bridge? So maybe tell people, first of all, where that comes from, <laughs> yeah. living under a bridge. And um, and and then I'll I'll get I'll I'll respond to this, and then ask you uh, maybe the the last question, which is about also the courses in addition to the right on the side, like uh, maybe tips about I don't know wh whatever anything related to the the courses, because this is also why Mark was or he's going to be doing a course because on on you, Demi, because of you, so you're not influencing. 300,000 people and uh yeah mark in this case but uh, <laughs> how the the see this is this is a thing when it comes i've i've rebranded myself uh so many times over the past 3 years as part of you know survival of the fittest but not because not intentionally uh at at first i i was uh, unemployable for some time uh this was inspired by Mark Baker, Guru and Aerobic on, on Twitter because he was, I, I read his uh, Gangfit uh, book, the first two. I still they're great books, the by the way. I love his style. And fourth, yeah. yeah they're, uh, he's, yeah, it's all based on experience, responding to problems, just like you said. And I think he can do a, a good job in this case. But yeah, uh, so unemployable, et cetera, et cetera. And then when I moved back to Salamanca, Spain, where, where uh, I am now, uh, there's a nice Roman bridge. Uh, from the first century AD, I just took a picture and posted it uh, on on Twitter, and somehow it caught up. I I don't know why. I <laughs> like I Lebanon sardines and and all these <laughs> weird concoctions I do. So it's it's not that I, I I strategically kind of branded myself as a bridge dweller. It's just I posted it, and I don't even remember how. It, it caught up, and then I became a bridge dweller. At first, I I used to say, oh oh, it started with a joke. Uh, okay. I uh, something along the lines of uh, I this marketplace discussions is an attempt to bridge the gap between disciplines. So I wanted ah, to take go. philosophy back to marketplace to bridge the gap between disciplines. And the joke was, but I ended up living under that bridge, <laughs> and I had the picture of of that Roman bridge, and so people liked it, and it it became kind of my love brand. it. So and I then, have to ask you this question yeah. though before I forget. So have you ever actually slept under a bridge, like literally? I'm 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 not sure. I I think I might have slept under a bridge, uh, honestly, because we we used to go camping a lot back in back okay. in Lebanon. So 
not that I'm aware of, but I slept in nature like for oh, so many, yeah, the, for so many years. I I don't uh, if if it if we did sleep if I did sleep under a bridge, it wasn't it wasn't as nice as this Roman bridge here in Salamanca. Got it. And this is why I switched from living under a bridge to dwelling under a bridge. Ah. Uh. Got That's it. why I'm a bridge dweller now because I go there uh, today. For example, uh, I spent an hour. I, I just go there. I listen to an audiobook. I just contemplate. It's really, really nice. It's nice. So it 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 caught up. Uh, but yeah, now I'm I've also rebranded. Uh, but uh, yeah, well, I love the rebrand. By the way, love the yeah. new look. Love the the. And by the way, this that sort of. I'm glad you said that because that's part of the whole idea of trying new things like so what like you know you rebranded into something new you have to be right only once like this is the idea behind it right like no one's going to remember things that you've changed they might but that might actually be a good thing over time right oh you remember how it used to be so you know companies do it all the time and doesn't it doesn't hurt for you to try different things as a as an entrepreneur uh, the only difference is now i i could spare uh, some cash uh, to hire a <laughs> uh, professional. Uh, so Lama, this is a shout out. Uh, Lama uh, Ramadan from uh, Brand and and she she did an amazing job. Like I didn't even notice the bridge until someone pointed it out in my logo, the MR. But but yeah. So oh, nice. Thank good you job, very Lama. much, Lama. You did a really <laughs> good job. If anyone wants uh, rebranding, uh, you can. I'll I'll actually I'll link uh, eventually. But uh, yeah. So. Any uh, final, whatever, uh, anything you'd like to say, maybe anything you'd like to share. Uh, this was uh, really enjoyable for me, by the yeah, way. Yeah, likewise. And if it were for me, I would spend like three hours, I know, but uh, <laughs> let's, let's, let's end it here. Uh, we we want to give listeners a break. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, look, uh, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for inviting me over. Thank um, you for agreeing. This is one of the more... Um, sort of internal exploration type interviews and podcasts I've been on and I really enjoyed it because it's like I sometimes I find it hard to talk about myself and literally seriously it, was, it felt like therapy so thank you uh, <laughs> I love I'm, your I'm uh, this was this was nice yeah yeah and I love your your idea behind bridging different um concepts and fields and 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 philosophies on that and i look forward to connecting uh, more online uh on twitter and in the small bets community so uh i'm just available like i'm on twitter at author on yeah the tell side, us where on yeah. my website yeah if you want to find me just head over to writer on the side.com my blog is there my podcast is there all my links to uh twitter or linkedin if you want to connect there happy to 